Hello. Hi. Thank you all for coming this evening. Um, we, as, as you all know, all programs at the Darien Library are um, come through the generosity of our friends. And tonight, um, Wes Haynes, the president of the Merritt Parkway Conservancy, is with us. He's a friend of Jim Cameron's, and Jim is going to introduce him. Right. Nice crowd tonight. Thank you all for showing up. I think you're really going to enjoy this. I, I saw Wes do this talk a few weeks ago and uh, was really impressed and recommended to the Darien Library that he invite, be invited to come down this evening. I know Wes because I serve on the board of directors of the Merritt Parkway Conservancy, and I think you're really going to enjoy this talk. Wes is executive director of the Merritt Parkway Conservancy, and if you're not familiar with it, it's a nonprofit member supported organization that's committed to the protection and stewardship of Connecticut's largest and most heavily used cultural resource. That's the Merritt Parkway, <laughs> which is listed on the National Register of Historic Places and a federally designated scenic byway. Wes is a native of Stamford, and his long career in historic preservation has included senior staff positions with the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, the Preservation League of New York State, and the New Jersey Historic Trust. He's also taught historic preservation at the Parsons School of Design in New York, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, and the Brooklyn High School for the Arts. And he currently serves as a volunteer preservation advisor to the Mary and Eliza Freeman Houses in Bridgeport, Stanford's First Presbyterian Church, and the New Canaan Preservation Alliance. Please welcome Wes Haynes. Well, thank you, Jim, and thank you, everybody. This is a great crowd tonight. Um, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to taking you on a little ride on the parkway, a little bit through time, a little time travel with the parkway, and uh, we'll see where we, we end up at the end of the, uh, of the evening. As Jim said, uh, the Merritt Parkway Conservancy, we're not a state agency, we're a nonprofit, and we were established in 2002 uh, when the parkway was just emerging from a very dark period in its history. It had uh, gone through a, a period of neglect that was, was really kind of sad. And uh, I think, let me just make sure I am doing this right, good. Um, a quote from Ada Louise Huxtable, who uh, many of you may know as a, a, an architectural critic uh, for the New York Times back in the 70s and 80s, kind of uh, uh, a gave a great definition of what a conservancy, like the Merritt Parkway Conservancy, is all about. Um, conservancies are established to protect something that was once considered universally great and universally appreciated, gets disappreciated uh, for one reason or another, uh, and, uh, and tries through a non-controversial, non-confrontational way uh, to change the subject and to, to turn right the boat, to, to uh, turn things around. And the Merritt Parkway Conservancy uh, was uh, part of a movement of, of conservancies, really starting with the Nature Conservancy in the 1950s, uh, but uh, that moved to protect water and clean air, uh, that moved into the built environment uh, in the 1980s. And so that's when we saw the, the creation of the Central Park Conservancy uh, to sort of take away the uh, Robert Moses work that had been done to the, uh, to the Central Park, which made it unusable to most people. Uh, to, uh, there were other conservancies established, the New York Landmarks Conservancy in New York City to, uh, to move in and create a, a little space between the developers who opposed landmarking of historic buildings and, uh, and the community in New York that really wanted their neighborhoods protected from overdevelopment. And today, I mean, New York has been transformed, Central Park has been transformed, these conservancies really work. So we, what we try to do is partner with uh, DOT in a non-confrontational way. Uh, we have separate missions. Uh, DOT is all about safety and efficiency and uh, the Conservancy is about stewardship of this great uh, resource, the Merritt Parkway, which I'll try to get you excited about this evening. So Ada Louise basically said the cycle is uh, a resource is appreciated, 
then it's relegated to the dustbin of history. Uh, but sooner or later, uh, if you wait long enough, um, it'll be reappreciated again. And that's exactly what's happening with the, with the parkway. So my talk is about the past and the future of the Merritt Parkway, uh, and the future being uh, really a vision to uh, update it to what we currently need from the parkway. Uh, we're different than the people that, uh, that built it. Uh, we have faster cars. Um, we have more cars on the parkway. Uh, and so there's adjustments that are being made. But, um, but uh, what we're trying to do is, is, uh, is get it back to with, with keeping its soul intact. So let's start with the origin of the parkway. Uh, it has a really long and wonderful uh, origin uh, that goes back really to the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the automobile was kind of uh, introduced very suddenly, and uh, the first president to take a ride in an automobile was Theodore Roosevelt in an electric car in Hartford, Connecticut. So we have a long association with the car. We had we gave birth to some of the early automobile industry in Connecticut, uh, eventually moved to the Midwest. Uh, but it was a sudden change, just like the internet was a very sudden change in the mid 20th century. Uh, we, uh, we weren't prepared. Our roads weren't designed for, for moving cars around. And by the 1920s, it was a problem in Connecticut. Uh, this is Westport uh, on the Boston Post Road in the 1920s. Um, People didn't really have clear rules on how to drive. Um, there were way too many cars on the road. You couldn't even move through the centers of, of, the, of southern Fairfield County uh, at, with any sort of alacrity. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, road improvements were made to the parkway, but they were pretty ugly. I mean, we, we were really creating extremely ugly environments, and a whole backlash rose up. It was the good roads movement and the anti-billboard movement uh, to say, let's, you know, if we're going to be creating these new spaces, these new public places for cars, let's at least not really destroy the landscape in the process. Uh, by 1922, uh, there was a new vehicle that was coming uh, up, and it wasn't just the automobile, it was the truck. And uh, truck traffic was very important to industrial Fairfield County. Bridgeport, Stamford, Norwalk were huge industrial centers uh, that uh, during World War I um, had, had serious problems moving stuff that we were making in Fairfield County uh, to Boston and Brooklyn where it was being used in the major Navy yards. So, uh, so there was a, a, a movement to create uh, new, ro uh, new roads for trucks. And trucks and cars didn't mix on the post road which was already crowded with cars. So uh, a, a new 30-mile state highway was planned uh, to parallel the Boston Post Road approximately six miles north of it. it basically, the, it was, this was the origin of the Merritt Parkway as a truck route through the undeveloped part of Fairfield County. And of course, I mean, people weren't that different from us then. People really were repelled by this idea of, of you know, through very wonderful rolling uh, hillside uh, to all of a sudden just introduce a, a truck lane. Also, it made no sense geographically because all the industries were located on the sound. So uh, uh, the people in Connecticut, um, the Fairfield County Planning Association, which we had, uh, in place by the 1920s, started looking over the line towards Westchester County. And they had been developing a system for the automobile called Parkways uh, since, the, uh, since about 1909 when the Bronx River Parkway opened. And uh, they found that for the investment in the parkway at $34 million uh, for the parkway system up to that point in time, uh, they were yielding $856 million of added value to real estate in Westchester County. So, you know, if you drive through Westchester County, it's got an enormous network of parkways. You get off those parkways and they are very, very dense uh, neighborhoods all from the 1920s that were developed as a result of that. So Fairfield County took note and said, well, maybe we should keep the trucks on Route 1 and develop a parkway to create real estate and added value to Fairfield County real estate. Uh, so th uh, the parkways um, in Westchester, the black line, uh, that's, the, there's the, the red line connects two, uh, two different 
roads. Uh, is, one is the built up Hutchinson River Parkway uh, to the left and to the right the dotted line was where uh, the, the truck route that was now being considered a parkway was to be located by about 1925. Now it took a lot longer to build the Merritt Parkway in, in Fairfield County because we are residents of Connecticut, we have very strong opinions about home rule, and you had to get every single town that this road, this new road went through to sign on to it. Uh, the person, the only person that was available and, 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 and basically uh, had the skill set to do this was our congressman who was uh, Schuyler Merritt. He was uh, an industrialist from Stanford. He was president of the Yale and Town uh, a lock factory. Um, and he was also our, our congressman for numerous years for the, through the first quarter of the, of the 20th century. And uh, he was the one that went through and sold this idea. Um, he needed this parkway. He needed to move uh, product from the Yale and Town factory and, and the other industries he was involved with um, out of Stanford. Uh, and he needed to seg segregate uh, truck and car traffic. So he really pushed it. And he cut a lot of deals with the individual uh, town committees in, in the numerous towns along uh, Fairfield County. And everybody seemed to add on another layer of, of desire. Uh, people didn't want billboards. People didn't want uh, anything that was ugly going through their, uh, their backyards. Um, people didn't want uh, a lot of, of noisy trucks. So, the parkway kind of evolved through that as a kind of a super parkway. It out parkwayed the Westchester parkways. It was a much different type of road. Um, and it, it, it's almost as if you're crossing in Europe into a different country when you go between Westchester County parkway system and into the Merritt parkway system. It's a completely different experience. So um, it evolved from a highway to a parkway and, uh, and People by 1925 were calling it Merritt's Parkway, a modern parkway uh, that was designed not just for uh, getting from here to there. Uh, it wasn't really even thought of as a commuter road at this point, but it was, it was designed for pleasant transit. And, uh, and so pleasure was a whole idea of this road. Now, Connecticut has never again built a, a road for pleasure at all. I mean, some of the roads that Connecticut has built since the parkway have been filled with pain. Uh, but uh, but this, uh, this road really evolved with this key principle in mind. There were precedents, uh, kind of glimmerings of precedents for, uh, for uh, a pleasure uh, drive in Connecticut, uh, but they're really rare and they're really pretty obscure. Uh, Chapin Point uh, was purchased in the, at the turn of the 19th century in the early 1800s by a sugar baron called Moses Rogers from New York City. And uh, Rogers really didn't want to develop it in his lifetime, but he did put a very fine avenue down the center of the peninsula of Chapin Point and, uh, and, and planted it with trees. And so if you look at the photograph um, in, on the upper left, uh, that's what it looked like in the 1860s when his estate was being auctioned off. The trees are sort of small. And by the um, 1920, uh, cir circa 1920, in the postcard view of, of the main uh, Moses Rogers Road, which is now Chapin Avenue, uh, is, uh, is really planted as a parkway. And so it's sort of a, an early republic parkway. But it wasn't the norm at all. Uh, Parkways uh, kind of evolved also from uh, the English uh, park planning uh, movement, which uh, the major proponent in the United States was Frederick Law Olmsted, a Connecticut native. Uh, Olmsted got control of the design and construction of Central Park in New York uh, in the 1860s and uh, introduced a number of innovations that he had observed in, in Europe. Uh, one of the most important ones was segregating uh, different types of traffic through the park. So there were pedestrians that used the park to stroll through on a Sunday afternoon. There were carriages that, that used it. There were bridle paths. Um, and so he did this with a series of, of bridges, then underpasses and overpasses. And uh, Central Park has some 35 bridges uh, within the park. They're all individually designed, one-offs. 
And that was a principle that uh, the planners of, of the Merritt Parkway adapted uh, some 50 years later. So as I mentioned before, no billboards was a primary principle um, in terms of informing how the parkway would take shape. And that's why we have a ban on commercial vehicles to this day. <clears throat> and it, it's tied to license plates. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's probably the most broken law in Connecticut uh, uh, universally. The, and the Conservancy is really trying to do something about that. Uh, we check in with the state police every now and then. Uh, we're trying to organize Boy Scouts to do uh, traffic counts and maybe do a little bit of uh, notification of some of the commercial traffic that is illegally using the parkway today. But, but we have fiercely been able to defend uh, the absence of, of ex extraneous signage, including billboards on the parkway. Uh, the parkway, um, one of the ideas uh, of the parkway was to blend into the uh, existing landscape. Now, the location of the parkway was one of the most difficult areas in the United States to build a road. Um, it was going across a, ceiling, a series of rolling ridges uh, that are quite beautiful, but if you looked at all the main roads before the Merritt Parkway was built, uh, we had the post road, which is located down at the Sound, where the ridges are pretty stubby at that point, and they're not that, uh, that insurmountable. And then we had a lot of north-south roads going uh, up in the valleys uh, between the ridges. But the parkway attempted to introduce a brand new road across that really rugged uh, landscape. And unlike Pennsylvania, which was also building its Pennsylvania Turnpike at the same time that the parkway was being built, uh, the, park, uh, the, the Pennsylvania uh, Turnpike uh, really did deep, deep cuts through the mountains. They had to go through the Alleghenies, even bigger mountains than we had, um, and they straightened it out. It's almost a straight shot. The proportions of the road if, uh, are very, very similar in terms of the original lane size, but uh, the Merritt instead uh, intentionally rolled with the hills. And in fact, um, early critics of the Merritt from New York State who felt that their parkway system was better, uh, called it a roller coaster uh, because it was uh, such up and down throughout. Uh, but the, the curves um, on the parkway uh, were intentional to break up the monotony of the drive. Uh, and some of them in Greenwich were very, very tight. Uh, that was the first stage built, and they realized that they were a little too tight for safe traffic, even at 45 miles an hour. Uh, but um, after that, they, they did straighten out the curves somewhat through the landscape. But it was, a, it was an idea of having a little park alongside the edge of the parkway, but with these long views out to the rolling hillside of Connecticut, which at that point was relatively undeveloped. All the development that you see near the parkway now that's screened by the large group of trees on either side of the parkway uh, was all in a consequence of the parkways being there and making it easy to commute to New York. Uh, another. Um, uh, thing like Central Park, um, the parkway was the first road to be completed that eliminated all at-grade crossings. Um, it beat the Pennsylvania Turnpike by about four months um, and in terms of its official opening to do that. But they were the first two highways in the United States to, uh, to be completely built without any stop signs at intersections or yield signs. Uh, that you could just drive, you could get on the parkway, and if you didn't have to get off, you just kept going for uh, 37 and a half miles. Um, and to the, the idea of the cloverleaf interchange, which was a graceful way to exit and, and deaccelerate as you got off a uh, road, um, was a theory uh, up until the time of the parkway's uh, construction. And the parkway was the first one to kind of systematically do it, although there was no opportunity to put a pure clover leaf, one that had four identically sized circles for the exit ramps and entrance ramps, because it had so much existing ledge and existing development to deal with. So the, the, but the concept is, is, the, is first executed on the Merritt Parkway. So no stop signs. This was, this was a very, very uh, popular thing. Uh, rumor had it that, um, that this was uh, uh, an idea that the, many of the town leaders in Fairfield County who wanted to get uh, to the Yale uh, Bowl games uh, wanted uh, input in, and that, that's, that was probably a, a truth. 
Um, it cut down the amount of time, which was close to four hours to get from New York City to New Haven for a Yale game, uh, down to like, uh, the, the parkway didn't originally go to, to New Haven. It dropped you back down onto the post road when it was first built in Milford. But, um, but it, was, uh, it cut that time of travel time to New Haven uh, in more than half. It was pretty amazing. And of course, it wasn't uh, missed on, on advertising uh, opportunities either. Uh, the uh, parkway, unlike the, West, the early phase of the Westchester Parkway system, uh, was built with a continuous median divide. So instead of the traffic uh, you know, just being divided by a painted white line on the road, there was actually a grass strip. That wasn't a new idea in street design. Uh, boulevards, uh, many of the streets in Bridgeport, you go to New Orleans, I mean, many of the urban areas, uh, Boston, uh, are, are planted with green strips. But for a limited access highway uh, that was just meant, you know, for you to go as fast as possible from one point to another, um, it was a real innovation and uh, it broke new ground there. And way before the concept of pollinator pathways uh, was before anybody, uh, the landscape architect of the Merritt Parkway, Weld Thayer Chase, uh, it, it specifically wanted to keep the vegetation on the parkway as uh, native vegetation. He didn't want to introduce the ornamentals that have been introduced in the, West, in the Westchester Parkway system, which were very beautiful and very showy, uh, but he felt that the Connecticut landscape deserved to, it, it, it would blend, the parkway would blend into the major landscape much better if he kept the, uh, the vegetation uh, native. And um, instead of drawing out his ideas of planting for the guys who were lugging that tree off the truck, um, he set up little mock gardens. Um, this is a little mock-up that he had uh, for the parkway. Those two dirt tracks are actually the, the, the lanes of the parkway. And uh, he would put sticks of, of the type of species of tree in the ground to indicate where he wanted uh, the, the plantings to go. Uh, it was um, uh, the first really automobile road that had in full integration of landscape and architecture. And by that I mean um, the, the architecture uh, was the primary, the infrastructure, the hardscaping was there first and the, the way that the uh, landscape sort of brought up to the, um, uh, to the hardscaping, the soft, the plantings, the, the, the pieces of the scenery that are in constant uh, change uh, was, was really well considered. And so, you know, the, the bridges would sort of reveal themselves for these openings in the shrubs and the trees that were planted on the parkway. Uh, this is one of uh, well, um, Thayer's um, uh, drawings of one of the bridges and his concept for planting around the, uh, the abutments. The, uh, uh, this is the architect's uh, version of the same kind of thing, of, of looking at it from the bridge point of view um, and what, uh, what his feeling was too. The, the planting was meant to be minimal around the bridges because the bridges were really very show-offy on the Merritt Parkway. Uh, unlike any other uh, uh, bridges. Uh, George Dunkelberger was um, an unemployed architect um, who had, well, he wasn't unemployed, he was a principal of, an of a Hartford firm, but he couldn't find any work during the Depression, so he went to work for the Department of Highways as the lead architect, and he ended up designing 69 uniquely individual bridges. If you've heard the rumor that these were um, uh, designed at frat parties at Yale, um, that is a false rumor. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry to break your bubble. But um, every bridge on the parkway, even though there are only three separate structural systems that are used inside these bridges to construct them, um, each, uh, each of the bridges was uh, detailed differently. And the really remarkable thing about the parkway is that they all have an Art Deco sensibility to them. Um, either in the, in the grace of the lines, the kind of lines they use, or in specific details. And uh, many people regard this as the largest Art Deco construction in the United States. So uh, the, uh, one of the earliest bridges was uh, the Guinea Road Bridge in Stamford, 
which is uh, unusual because it's one of only three bridges on the parkway that are faced with uh, natural stone. The rest are made out of concrete. Uh, Guinea Road um, ended up being way too expensive to, uh, to construct uh, and would have blown the budget that the highway department had put aside for the bridges. So uh, they decided to go with the less expensive material, concrete. This appalled uh, the, archi the, the landscape architects who designed the Westchester County system. They felt that concrete was an inferior material. Obviously, it's the, today it's the de rigueur uh, material for highway bridges. But back then, it was, uh, it was considered a very innovative and, and kind of gutsy thing to do. And uh, this is uh, one of the more uh, Art Deco bridges, um, the Madison Avenue Bridge in Trumbull, uh, which looks like it's almost uh, like a billowing laundry on a, on a laundry line. It's like this curtain that just kind of waves in and out. So the plasticity of concrete, Dunkelberger really fooled around with it. And uh, I, he accomplished some wonderful, wonderful details with it. Uh, for example, this is a uh, this is a kind of a Renaissance detail called a banderole that, uh, that you find in Renaissance doorways and mantelpieces, a European Renaissance, um, that's blown up to supersize uh, and rendered in concrete on the parkway as just a decorative feature. Uh, one of my favorite bridges, and maybe yours too, is Merwin's Lane, which is really one of the most expressive bridges uh, both in its just form, I mean, these horizontal bands are just stunning to, to look at, uh, but also the details of it, uh, the spider, web, the cast iron spider web railing um, that is, uh, is just really just a piece of beautiful artwork. Uh, there was one sculptor who did most of the, the sculptural work on the parkway. So Dunkelberger would design the massing and work very closely. He didn't do actual drawings for the sculptural parts of the bridges. He did them for the forms and the massings. But uh, Edward Ferrari, who had a studio in New Haven, uh, was commissioned with doing all the sculptural work. So he did the actual modeling of the, the insects and the spider web. Um, and w except for one detail uh, that, his fa that Ferrari's father did, who was um, a well-known sculptor, um, uh, all the work is Ferrari's. So the Nike sculpture that, uh, this isn't Nike sneakers, this is the uh, classical Nike, um, which is a monument to the civil engineers who worked on the uh, parkway on the James Farms uh, Road Bridge. And then the, this owl casting, um, this, is a, uh, this is a bridge that runs underneath the parkway. So when you're on the parkway, you never see this owl. You have to be on Hillside Road in Fairfield to really enjoy this owl. So this, this, he, Dunkelberger was using these wonderful details even for the benefit of you know, the smaller volume traffic uh, that was appreciating the parkway. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the men who built the parkway, and they were, it was all a crew of men, uh, about 2,000 laborers built the parkway. And um, it, created, uh, it provided really desperately needed work during the Depression. Um, and uh, Earl Wood, who was the superintendent of construction, uh, was interviewed later in life and said, you know, he didn't know of anybody who complained. Everybody felt that they were doing something for the country, uh, something for uh, the state, uh, creating something bigger than themselves in building the parkway. And the Conservancy uh, hears frequently from people who are the children and grandchildren of people that worked on the parkway. And if there's anybody here tonight, I, I would love to talk to you after, the, after my talk. Or if you know of someone, I'd love to be in touch with them. Uh, there was also like a lot of early heavy uh, equipment used on the parkway um, because even though they tried to keep the parkway as free as possible of road cuts, they did have to cut through some of the ledge at the, at the taller hills. And uh, uh, this itself was kind of a, an object of fascination. And uh, WPA artist uh, Howard Heath uh, spent uh, about three months just uh, doing watercolor sketches, they're all up in the state archives, of, um, of the men at work on the parkway. And they're some of the most evocative uh, images of the parkway under construction. 
and uh, in, in including how they form the bridges, which are also important uh, when it comes to de making decisions on restoring the bridges today. For a while there, while the parkway was building, being built, it created a few surreal moments in the landscape. Um, this is the Sport Hill Road Bridge, which is now Easton Turnpike um, in uh, Fairfield, um, which you know predated the uh, the develop the, the arrival of the parkway to it. Uh, the parkway required uh, the demolition of a number of, of older buildings along the right of way or the removal or the relocation of them. But you can sort of see how, um, how they worked it here um, in back in 1930, in the 1930s. So they brought the side roads gently up to uh, a point where they could cross the parkway uh, the bridges were intentionally kept low for that reason so that they didn't have to bring these side roads up and make them like way up and then way down again. Um, and they avoided this idea of the flyover, which we now do um, if you've been up to uh, Waterbury, the Mixmaster at the intersection of Route 8 and 84 is kind of like one of the uh, most expressive examples of, uh, <laughs> of what the parkway is not. And, uh, and so it, you can see how that worked with the bridge without the landscape in place that. So they would cut certain areas of the parkway and when they, cut the, when they had to dig and, and dig out for earth to berm up and make uh, the roadbeds, uh, they made ponds and there were all sorts of man-made water features along the parkway that were made in the depressions left by the, the quarry sites. And this is one of the houses being moved away from that bridge uh, after it was constructed. So um, at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> there's, a, you know, there's a myth that the parkway is a WPA project. And there was WPA funding in the parkway, but it was only about 2% of the total cost of the parkway. Uh, the parkway cost an astounding $22.7 million, uh, built over a period of four years. And um, of that, 27% was paid by the state and the other 71% was paid by bonds um, issued by Fairfield County municipalities for the parkway. So this was a real unusual funding scenario compared to how roads are funded today. 80% federal money and 20% um, state money and very little uh, local um, input in them. And I think it, it shows because it is such a great road and I think that, you know, if if the people of Fairfield County were paying for it, they wanted something built that they wanted and not something that was being forced on them from somewhere else. It, all, it was also interesting because um, it involved a lot of civic engagement, uh, which is also difficult to do um, in these times. Uh, but the garden clubs in each of the communities sort of took it upon themselves to plant some of the more ornamental features of the parkway. Um, we had a lot of mountain laurels in the, in the original scheme. Uh, the mountain laurels got largely killed by salt spray. Um, they didn't realize that salt would, uh, uh, planting so many mountain laurels would, uh, would eventually end in their demise. Uh, the dogwood blight of a few years ago, a few decades ago, took out a lot of the original dogwoods, but we are putting dogwoods back on the parkway. Uh, but, but those were the kind of ornamentals that uh, the local garden clubs contributed to. And I know a lot of the garden clubs in Fairfield County still want to get engaged uh, with the, uh, the, the parkway, and it's very difficult with uh, the bureaucracy we have in, in Hartford. The biggest impact was that, uh, um, uh, and, and a number of scholars have pointed this out recently in Connecticut, is that it introduced modernity to Connecticut. Connecticut was a little bit uh, set in its ways uh, it was very, very proud of its colonial past. It was kind of ashamed of its industrial present at the time. Uh, so it kind of kept looking back at the pilgrims and, and overlooking all the other uh, things that Connecticut had, had contributed to American culture. But, um, but it, uh, it really did, was a gateway to that. And it did, uh, re you know, it did have elements of that too. It coincided with these, um, the 300th anniversary of the founding of the city of New Haven, uh, which uh, coincided with the opening of the parkway. Um, and the, uh, the Native American sculptor on the right was done by Edward Ferrari's father. 
uh, the noted uh, Italian sculptor. It uh, was uh, immediately hailed at the 1939 World's Fair as the road of the future. There was actually a miniature diorama of the parkway that was built and exhibited. Um, we've never been able to find a photograph of it, and we have no idea what happened to the diorama. But, um, but there was a scale model that was built um, in, the, in the exhibit, and it was uh, an outflow allowing a lot of Connecticut uh, residents to uh, get directly into the Westchester Parkway system and down to see the, uh, the World's Fair. And these are just some views of it as it, as it opened, which looks very m different from the way it looks today. Um, but the landscape architects had envisioned it to, you know, the, the plants to grow up over time. They left a lot of um, existing large trees in place. Um, they didn't, uh, they took out junk trees that they didn't want. There was a lot of selection going on at that point. Uh, but it was a much uh, lower growth uh, kind of experience back then. It, um, f it had an interruption of, of uh, passenger cars. Uh, during 19, the 1940s, it became a major military highway between uh, Brooklyn and Boston and uh, was used for convoys uh, to go back and forth. And gas rationing was in place during World War II, so there weren't, wasn't a lot of opportunity for people to do pleasure driving anyway. So let's briefly go through the period of decline. And I, and I think it's sort of summed up in these statistics here. Um, it, in 1938, it was designed for 45 miles per hour. And the last time that uh, speeds were uh, studied in any depth, was it was 2003, and the 85% of drivers were averaging 73 miles an hour on the parkway, even though the posted limit is 55. Uh, it, it was uh, handled 18,000 cars per day very gracefully in 1938. Uh, in 2003, that count was 57,000. Uh, today, it's probably closer to 70,000 a day, which puts the parkway in the millions of, of, of cars per year uh, it, that it handles. Uh, by the 1970s, um, there was a lot of pressure to widen the parkway. The parkway was built with a right-of-way that anticipated the possibility of adding another four lanes. Uh, on the south uh, edge of the parkway. Um, that was um, uh, an idea that they, they acquired, and the state acquired enough land to do that. Uh, and uh, Mr. Diderio, who used to uh, own the Hi-Ho Diderio up in Fairfield, um, uh, came up with a proposal. He was a road builder uh, in the 1980s to double the parkway, to, to do an imitation parkway side by side. And, you know, it was a an interesting idea, but, but doing, a doing an identical road that was then out of, out of scale, really, to the way cars were built and driving, um, and was also would have been cost prohibitive to copy all those bridges in the 1980s, uh, the idea never went very far. So when uh, Bridgeport uh, really felt that it needed to, uh, to expand the north routes out of Bridgeport, Route 8 and Route 25 northbound, uh, they pushed and they had uh, two interchanges completely reconfigured. And thus arose the, the first protest movement against the parkway, which was the Save the Merit Committee. Uh, and they were very effective at getting the state to scale back uh, slightly the design, but they weren't effective at stopping it. Uh, and that's when people started to get alarmed. Subsequently to that, um, the parkway was listed uh, by the um, uh, World Monuments Fund as one of the most endangered properties in the historic properties in the world, and by the National Trust for Historic Preservation as one of the most endangered properties in the world. So um, this is basically what um, the parkway, if, if, that, um, if that movement hadn't been stopped, uh, the parkway would pretty much look like any other road in Connecticut right now. We would have lost all the specialness. It probably wouldn't move traffic faster than it does right now either. Um, when it came to uh, uh, the city of Norwalk and the city of Danbury pushing for Super 7 uh, to be built up the Route 7 corridor um, was just after the Merritt Parkway uh, Conservancy was founded. 
And we found ourselves in the awkward position of trying to be non-confrontational, but having to sue the state to stop the construction of an interchange that would have been even bigger than the Route 8 or Route 25 interchange. Uh, and we succeeded in court. Fortunately, the, uh, the, the parkway uh, at that point was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. There were federal controls over the expenditure of federal money on, on public properties, and, uh, and we won in court. We got an injunction. Uh, the judge said, go away, DOT and Conservancy, go work out an, uh, an alternative. And we're still working on it uh, since 2002. Uh, we're closing in on a solution, uh, but we're still working on it. Uh, so this is what, uh, um, it, it's one of our main stewardship challenges today for the parkway. Now, the reappreciation of the parkway. Um, started when, once the, uh, during the Weicker administration, we had a very enlightened commissioner of transportation. Uh, and, uh, and so we uh, were able to get the Mayor Parkway listed on the National Register. Um, the DOT had op opposed listing it on the register uh, up until that point, even though many, many people in, in the county and many people in the state wanted to see it on the register. And that triggered uh, establishing design guidelines for corridor improvements to adapt the, the, the merit to handle more gracefully uh, the type of volume and the type of speeds uh, and the way people were driving. So there were three sets of guidelines that were developed. One was for the corridors themselves, the roadways. Uh, there were ideas that um, we needed to establish a breakdown lane. The, the, the merit had never been designed with a breakdown lane. So there, were, uh, there was a design that was uh, developed for, specifically for the merit. Uh, the, uh, each side would be widened by four feet on the right-hand lane, and, uh, and that would be paved as part of a breakdown. And then part of the four feet in front of the, uh, the planted area on the right-of-way uh, would be put in a stabilized uh, uh, earth. So it's, it, when you pull off, you pull off onto solid pavement, but it only looks about half the size of what you're pulling off on. Uh, there were other, there were other uh, um, ideas in that, and I'll show you a couple in a minute. There was also a landscape master plan that, that called for uh, bringing back some of the uh, species that had been lost over time and uh, putting in hardier uh, uh, hybrids. And, uh, and then um, a bridge uh, study was done looked at the condition of the bridges. The concrete was holding up very well for uh, concrete of its age in the 1980s, uh, but they, they did, it did need a lot of work. Uh, concrete does weather uh, over time, and, and concrete relief, sculptural relief, does weather off. So this is how the, um, the adding the breakdown lanes works. Um, this is before the breakdown lane was, was added in March 2009 uh, from the Morehouse uh, Bridge Road, uh, Morehouse Road Bridge, and uh, without any changes to the median, but only over to the side, um, this is while it's in construction. So you can see the area that was disturbed uh, and added onto very clearly with this. Um, so it did require them cutting back on the ledge. And this, um, this was the first phase of eight phases of corridor improvements um, that, uh, that were introduced uh, starting in the early 2000s. And we're uh, just starting the eighth of those eight phases uh, next year, which will be Norwalk. So the pain that you've gone through for the last three years in Westport is going to be relocated to Norwalk. Uh, and there'll be three more years of it, and then uh, the, the parkway corridor will be uh, fully rehabilitated uh, and brought up to uh, a, a more contemporary standard. Uh, one of the uh, uh, the uh, details um, over the, the guide rails that had been put in the parkway were very, very spartan early on. They were few and far between. Uh, they weren't really needed all that much, but uh, uh, they were made out of wood, and wood rots pretty quickly. So uh, over time, they were replaced with galvanized steel. Uh, steel bends and gets deformed and gets pretty ugly pretty quickly. So uh, the, uh, the guidelines developed a new uh, detail called the Merritt Parkway 
uh, guide rail, which is used throughout the country. It's accepted by the federal DOT, and it's used in parks around the country. It's called the Merritt Parkway gu Guide Rail. And um, it's a steel-reinforced wooden uh, guide rail. So, um, you know, if you wonder why when you're driving the parkway, the guide rail is one material, and then you go into another section, it's another material, it's just because that the old steel guide rails haven't been replaced. But by the time the corridor is done, uh, it will have the Merritt Parkway guide rail throughout. Um, bridge restoration is a major uh, uh, feature. We, we uh, have done 40 of the bridges so far. There's still 29 that need to be done. And 15 of those are slated to be done during the Norwalk improvement um, between uh, 2020 and 2023. And uh, this is the Comstock Hill uh, Bridge. This is the one with those wonderful sculptural reliefs by the Ferrari father and son. And um, I, I hope you can see from this photograph that the dark uh, area there is an area that had been tagged with graffiti, um, DOT. Uh, whenever they see that, they try to cover it up immediately, but they don't really do very careful paint matching uh, necessarily. So uh, we're, we're trying to get them to do better paint matching, uh, but also uh, to be, still be responsive. But this bridge clearly needs to be cleaned and cleaned very gently and sensitively so we don't lose any of the sculptural relief of those wonderful uh, uh, pilgrim and uh, Native American. Uh, the, the, uh, this is a standalone bridge pro project that we've been waiting for 10 years. This bridge is mostly steel frame bridge, and uh, it needs uh, Lake Avenue in, in uh, Greenwich. And uh, it's one of the last bridges put on the parkway, and it's very different. It was built while there was traffic moving underneath it, unlike the other bridges that were built before even the parkway reached them. Um, and so this one is much more, built more like a modern bridge that's more components than something that's cast in place with, with a lot of, of detail. So it's, it's largely just a plain steel uh, span carried by, uh, by stone and concrete abutments, uh, but it has this beautiful uh, decorative screen on it um, that is uh, a grape motif that comes out of the Connecticut State sh uh, uh, Shield. And it uh, originally was painted in three colors. It's today painted uh, blue about 25 years ago, but it's mostly rusted through, so it's mostly brown now. Uh, but when it's uh, repainted, it's going to be this uh, beautiful uh, dark, uh, the, all the grape relief, as, as you can see in the historic photograph on the left, uh, will be re-revealed uh, on, the, on the bridge, and it's going to be kind of magical to go through. I can't wait to see this one repainted. And here the Conservancy brought into the project, um, we, we were able to bring in a conservator from New York uh, to do paint analysis, to get down there, take little pieces of, of uh, paint layers, look at them under a microscope, and match the original color scheme, uh, which had been uh, painted over only twice in its 80-year period, which wasn't enough. Another project that we got involved with, which isn't really part of the corridor studies, but uh, in, the, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the state decided to upgrade the service areas. They were really badly in need of upgrading. And uh, the, the initial proposal was to tear down the Colonial Revival uh, service stations. They were built as garages uh, originally in 1940. Uh, they were an afterthought on the parkway. Um, they realized that if you're going to be this far out in the countryside and that far away from a gas station and people are always breaking down, uh, you needed gas stations on the, on the parkway. But uh, today the needs are different. Uh, the needs uh, are not so much for gas on the parkway because you can get them on the side roads, uh, but for convenience and for rest areas. So uh, they were being completely rethought. And um, we, uh, we were able to talk DOT and the, uh, the tenant, uh, the, these are leased out to a concessionaire, uh, to keep the existing building. And um, an architect on our board was able to advise them on the design of the uh, gas uh, pumping stations and, uh, and just how to treat the, the original buildings. So they weren't restorations of the buildings, they were adaptive uses, but uh, we still have the original buildings there and the scale. One of the things that uh, probably everybody is aware of right now, tolls are being considered in Connecticut, and um, the Conservancy doesn't have a position for or against the tolls. 
but, um, but we are dead set against having gantries uh, put on the parkway. Uh, it will completely destroy the experience of the parkway. You'll be able to see them for miles. Um, they will just um, be a deal killer. This, the gantry on the lower left here is a gantry on the Garden State Parkway in New Jersey, which is a parkway in name only. Um, it is not a parkway-like experience, and we really want to protect uh, that. So um, if, whether you're for or against the tolls, please talk to your legis state legislature, uh, legislator, uh, your senator, your representative, and just say, uh, you know, please don't put gantries on the parkway. Uh, we also don't think they're appropriate for the Wilbur Cross, as they're, they're talking about uh, doing on the Wilbur Cross as well. This is a, a diagram that was done um, uh, in a documentation study that led to uh, the reappreciation of the parkway. It uh, showed basically how the growth by uh, the 1990s had uh, caught up with the parkway. And this is probably one of the most existential uh, stewardship challenges we face on the parkway, is managing the vegetation. I mean, the, the bridge stuff we've got down pretty well. The, the corridor will be rehabilitated uh, in another four years, and the Jersey barriers will go away, but ve vegetation management is still a real problem on the parkway. Uh, the, the parkway was never meant to really be this dense with foliage, um, and uh, some people really love these trees, uh, but you know some of them are you know they, they get a little bit uh, quirky, like the one here that looks like it's been pruned very poorly several times. Um, you know we're okay about taking those trees out, but we really are trying to protect healthy trees. Uh, we absolutely take safety very seriously, and there are a number of tree species that were planted that have reached their climax, and they need to be taken out. And we're uh, saying goodbye to a lot of the white pines uh, just because they are posing a real danger uh, to people on the parkway. Uh, the ash trees are all being attacked by emerald ash borers. Uh, it's just a matter of time before they're gone. But so far, the, um, the blight on the oak trees that is uh, present in eastern Connecticut hasn't migrated this way in western Connecticut. And as long as that's the case, we're very protective of our oak trees. Uh, but the trees do come down um, in, and cause storm damage. Uh, they, they block the road. They pre prevent emergency vehicles from getting um, in to deal with the, the cleanup, and they, they stop traffic. Uh, so one of the things that uh, um, we have been really aggressive about is controlling invasives. Um, there are a lot of invasives, vines that are choking the trees, that are killing them behind the right-of-way. Um, this is a, 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 a piece of equipment that uh, is small, that can navigate around uh, difficult terrain and without taking out a lot of trees. Um, one of the problems that we faced um, after Sandy was that the state went in very aggressively in New Canaan and Norwalk and took down um, maybe too many trees. And, uh, and we were very unhappy about that. We let them know. Uh, we've been negotiating with them ever since to use more sensitive equipment on the parkway that can be a little bit more selective in what they take out so they don't have to clear cut these huge swaths that they had been doing. And, uh, and we just tried out some new equipment in Greenwich um, just earlier this year, and it seems to be working very well. They can take out a huge dead tree uh, without getting onto, the, onto the, the grassy area and compressing all the soil and inviting new invasives in and clear cutting their way in to reach the dead tree so they can reach it all from the roadway, and it's really pretty impressive. Uh, we have um, also been wary about the proposal for the multi-use trail that uh, would go along the south right-of-way of the parkway, which um, was the, the area that was left for, uh, for the additional expansion of the parkway, should it ever be needed. And, uh, and we don't oppose the concept of, of having people ride bicycles through, through there, but we do oppose the, the concept of making this uh, a multi-use trail that is designed to a federal standard that would require uh, separating it from the parkway with a chain link fence, which I think would be a kind of a buzzkill to drive the entire length of the parkway along a chain link fence, um, and lighting it at night and paving the walkway. 
um, and, uh, you know, leveling the grade changes even more aggressively than the parkway itself is, is leveled. It would, it would require a whole level of infrastructure and it would be a very major investment and we feel that that investment could probably be put to better use on the parkway. Uh, we are considering a, a program working with DOT of lighting the bridges, maybe for special occasions. Uh, this was something the Conservancy did back in 2002, uh, uh, one holiday season. Uh, we lit two of the bridges. Um, it was pretty well received. Um, and uh, I, I don't know about you, but I've been noticing Lockwood Matthews being lit up now at night uh, from I-95, and it is stunning. It is really an impressive uh, uh, moment. That, that building that was just a dark area at night really jumps out at you. So um, I, I feel that uh, this would be a way to kind of celebrate the bridges in a, in a certain way. And uh, at the end of the day, I mean, the parkway is both a work of art, in my opinion, and also a subject of art. Uh, there have been many painters from de Koenig to um, Cindy Mullins, who is our own Fairfield County artist. Uh, she has done a series of beautiful, evocative paintings of the Merritt Parkway. Um, and, and I think it, um, it kind of brings home uh, a statement made when the parkway opened in the Bridgeport Post that the parkway is f fills, the, uh, fills the eye with beauty and the mind with peace. And I think that that's what this road is all about, and that's why I'm so hot on it. I also grew up on it, and I've driven it forever, and I, I still love it. And since we're in a library, let me uh, just uh, uh, introduce you to a couple of books if you want to learn more about the Merritt Parkway. Um, the book on the left was done in, uh, by Bruce Rad in the 1980s. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful, comprehensive uh, study of the artistic qualities of the Merritt Parkway and some of the politics that went into it. Uh, Traveling the Merritt Parkway is part of the Images of America series. Uh, it goes town by town through the parkway and does a kind of a chronological narrative of, of, the, uh, of photographs of the parkway in construction and over time. And uh, it, uh, it's, it's a wonderful sort of guide if you're interested in a, one town in particular. Uh, my predecessors at the Conservancy, Jill Smith and Lori Heiss, who you may know, um, wrote a book uh, together uh, the Merritt Parkway, The Road That Shaped a Region, which really looks uh, at some of the internal uh, discussions going on with the, how the, the parkway developed as a, a public space and also the impact that that public space had on development in Fairfield County. And two books that just came out this year, this past year, uh, one is a collection of a uh, now defunct magazine called Connecticut Circle which promoted the suburbanization of Connecticut at a time, uh, was published right after World War, um, uh, right uh, before World War II until right after World War II. And uh, it kind of created the idea of Connecticut that we all know from Hollywood, of you know the wonderful, charming place where the snow is always falling and out in the woods and a, you know people put on plays and everybody comes to them and blah, whatever. So it's, it's that kind of uh, image that it was promoting for Connecticut. But the Merritt Parkway was central to that identity um, uh, of, of getting people uh, to move out of urban uh, areas into the bucolic uh, hillside of Connecticut. And my former colleague at the Connecticut Trust, Chris Wiegren, uh, has just done a book uh, that tells the story of Connecticut through 100 pl places. And, uh, uh, and Chris is uh, very insightful. Uh, person, if you like, um, if you like architecture, um, I would hope that the, the library has it, um, and uh, I would hope they get it if they don't have it, um, for you to take out and enjoy. They're very brief entries on, on it. So uh, that's our website. Uh, if you want to find out more about the Conservancy, please go on the website, and I am happy to take any questions you may have. I've been blathering on here for a while now. Thank you. Yes. The, the, the question is where do, what is our coverage? And we, we, the uh, National Register nomination only covers the Merritt Parkway. The Wilbur Cross was an extension of the Merritt Parkway, 
uh, that was actually funded by the tolls from the Merrick Parkway when they put tolls in um, after, uh, after they went in. It wasn't really part of the original plan. Uh, but we only cover the merit. Uh, we frequently um, get calls about uh, the, the Wilbur Cross. And we're also monitoring the uh, DOT's conceptual idea of adding a third tunnel through West Rocks in New Haven, which we feel would, uh, would be a mistake because that could change the, uh, the volume on the, on the merit ultimately. Yes, uh, the question is the, the, that uh, property owners objected to uh, uh, trees being cut down and the road was bent around them. Th there is one case in New Canaan. It was called the Lapham Oak, and it was uh, off the, it was basically where Waveney is. Uh, it was uh, uh, on the shoulder at Waveney. And it was an ancient oak, and uh, the commissioner uh, basically agreed not to cut it down. The, the oak eventually did die. and. Uh, but it was very controversial. And uh, there was a, um, actually an article in Connecticut Circle Magazine that had photographs of it from two different angles, one that emphasized the curve and one that showed that there was just a little tiny bend and it was pretty close to the road. I mean, when you, um, I, I had the pleasure of driving the uh, Redwood Highway in, uh, in the Pacific this summer. And you know, the Redwoods, the road does bend around the trees there. I mean, they're big enough that it has to. And it's just an amazing drive. Um, I would have liked to have been on the parkway and have to have driven around the Lapham Oak, but uh, it's long gone, I'm afraid. There, there, uh, the question is, are there alternatives to gantries uh, for tolls? Uh, yes, there are, but if they're using the uh, standard Easy Pass system, it's gonna be difficult to get that, uh, that done. However, um, there are alternate ways of, of doing it. New York State uh, conducted a study recently when they were upgrading their Easy Pass system, and uh, it can be introduced into the railings, the, the tags can be, into the existing infrastructure of the highway. And we would rather see something like that happen uh, uh, with, um, with, with toll collection. Uh, Jim uh, Cameron uh, on our board has made the point, if I can quote you here, Jim, that if we can wait till uh, 5G technology is out, the whole technology is going to be completely different of, about the way that tolls are collected. And, and so if, you know, if we invest heavily this year in toll gantries, we'll be investing in 1980s technology to collect tolls that will soon be out of the way. So the, the question is, what went into what determined the height of the bridges? Um, was it to restrict buses from uh, coming on the parkway? Uh, the, the bus uh, story comes out of Robert Caro's uh, um, power broker about Robert Moses. Moses had nothing to do with the Merritt Parkway. Um, in fact, he had to respond to the Merritt Parkway when it was, you know, the parkway discussion was happening. He had to end up moving the parkway to a location, the Hutchinson Parkway to a location he didn't want to go. He wanted to follow more of the I-84 corridor with the, with the parkway system but he was locked into dumping it into uh, where it is in Greenwich uh, at this point. I can't confirm, I mean, I, I, I'm a great admirer of Robert Caro. That was never really a thing with Connecticut. I think it was really, because the, the buses would have all, they, if they couldn't make it through the bridges in, um, in Westchester County, they wouldn't be able to make it to the bridges in the Merritt. Um, it was really a factor of trying to integrate the landscape um, into, uh, without doing these big structures so that as you drive along the Merritt, I mean, you have this kind of feeling of peace because the bridges aren't all that exaggerated. They just kind of, they kind of roll over you a little bit. But yes, it, um, and also trucks were smaller then. They were able to move army convoys through them in, the, in World War II, uh, but trucks have just gotten a lot bigger now. The, the question is, it was, um, it was novel when it was built, and does the Conservancy think about making it the most innovative highway? We have had discussions on the board about improving wireless service along the, the highway and um, doing uh, you know, other amenities that, that can be done with minimal impact to the visual quality of it. So uh, you know, one of, you know, some of the ways that we're doing it um, not making the highway itself innovative, but making the interpretation and the understanding of, the, of its value innovative. Uh, we're uh, designing an interactive map on our website that you can pull up 
details and information about the specific bridges and see them in closer focus where if you're driving at 80 miles an hour, they're just kind of a blur. If, I, I love driving the parkway at 55 miles an hour. It's a lot of fun. And that, that may be the most innovative thing I say tonight, is just follow the speed limit. Yes. <laughs> so uh, those kind of things uh, we're doing. But uh, uh, you know, we, we, want, we, we understand that if, um, if we can't keep up with the times with the parkway, and I'm not just talking about the volume and the congestion, but if we can't keep up with making this a usable road for people in Fairfield County, we're, you know, we're not going to win this, this uh, battle with DOT in the long term. And DOT is not the enemy. It's just they have a different mission than we have. <laughs> OK, so that, there, there, were, there were two questions in that. Uh, one is about, can we introduce a barrier to prevent trucks from hitting the King Street Bridge? And can we reintroduce the, uh, the historic signs? Uh, so let's start with, with uh, King Street first. Um, King Street, fortunately, is, is the Hutchinson Bridge, so it's not our problem. And so we're glad that they're hitting the King Street Bridge <laughs> before they hit any of ours. But they're still hitting our bridges uh, a lot. Um, DOT is experimenting right now. Uh, uh, the Lapham Avenue Bridge just got hit this weekend again. Uh, it, uh, you, can, you can make it through with a rider truck on the southbound side uh, at the uh, west portal. But once you hit the east portal from the inside, you, you break it all you know, to smithereens. And it's been broken to smithereens a million times. So uh, we, uh, th th we are going to be introducing on a trial basis some sort of signaling system um, that, that signals uh, people before the, the, you know, they reach the trucks. Uh, but there's a systemic problem there, too, because some of the GPS systems like Waze don't mark the parkway as l limited to cars. So they'll if you're in a, driving a truck, it'll just, it, it won't just dif differentiate between any other Mark State Road, that the trucks are, are not allowed. And uh, the, basically the highest incidence of truck collisions happens in uh, the spring when college kids are moving back home with their stuff. Uh, they just, they're just like focused on ways and they, they're oblivious to like looking at the signs that say no trucks on this road. So, uh, we are, we are experimenting with a couple of things, but we don't want to clutter up the highway with a lot of you know, extra hardware as well. The, the question about signage. Um, because the parkway accepts federal funds for some of the bridge improvements and corridor improvements, the uh, DOT has to follow the, uh, the federal sign specs. And they've bent about as far as they can with us keeping, uh, we, we have to f use, you know, the standard lettering. They would never let us put back wood signs uh, again on the parkway. Uh, we had, w you know, signs that have been painted with the jagged edges to sort of look like those signs. Um, we may be able to fool around with them a little bit more, but, um, but right now the signs are being changed and um, there's a discussion going on about what the new signs will look like. So um, I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only one that's concerned about the signs, too, and I'll take your comments to heart. Thanks. Yes. The, the question is, the, um, ex, uh, uh, how, is the, how are the exits uh, off the uh, service areas allowed to, uh, to, to be so short? They are, and, and uh, they've been extended where they can be extended, um, but some of them are so close to entrance ramps or exit ramps to other, you know, activities on the parkway that they, they just can't be extended anymore. There's, and there's no way to put a clover leaf uh, in there to, to, to turn you around. You'd have to turn around the gas station. And like at New Canaan, there's, a, um, there's actually a, 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 a service uh, station, a service area for the DOT trucks right behind the uh, southbound uh, station. So, uh, it, you know, there's not a lot of space on those uh, service areas. And I think they've been stretched about as far as they, they can. But they, they were designed because, you know, you were, ex you were accelerating from zero to 35 and the oncoming traffic was in, as heavy and it was, you know, there was time to move over. So we, I mean, I think everybody recognizes it as a problem. 
um, and we just don't have a solution for it yet. Maybe autonomous vehicles are going to be the solution. <laughs> yes. So the, the question is, has, uh, uh, given the traffic congestion in Fairfield County, um, should the parkway be uh, upgraded or should it be kept in the same state and, and a new uh, vehicle for vehicles uh, introduced somewhere else or widening of I-95? We, I mean, it, it, it would be really expensive to widen the parkway any more than it is right now. Um, there'd be a lot of ledge cutting that would be required. It's, it already, and I, I would, I would uh, disagree with your premise that it's outlived its usefulness because it still carries 70,000 vehicles a day. And I, I think that that's, you know, three times the, the, what it was designed for. for so it's, it is handling it. And once the construction's out of the way, I think that the traffic's gonna even be uh, easier to handle. I, I think we have to change our ways, frankly. I mean, we can't build our way out of this. Um, more people are working from home. They're going into New York less frequently. Um, and, I think that that, and, and I think that the introduction, all kidding aside, of autonomous vehicles on the parkway would probably work. They're not gonna work in urban areas that well, but they'll, they'll work better to control traffic flow on, on places like I-95, limited access roads like I-95. We also need to do more carpooling, and maybe there's a, a way to do that, to get, you know, we, we can't, everybody can't get on and drive their own car on the parkway or I-95, or we're never gonna get out of this mess. I think that uh, also if we were to widen it, it is not just the actual physical cost of all the ledge work that would be needed uh, and bridge work, but there would also be a, a, a cost of real estate values adjacent to the parkway. Um, you know, those, those are some of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Connecticut, and that would have a huge economic impact on, on those neighborhoods. So I think, you know, if, if we were to introduce an I-95 on the Merrick Parkway corridor, uh, I think we would be shooting ourselves in the foot uh, in Fairfield County for the quality of life. So I'm relatively optimistic that there'll be a technological solution and maybe there'll be a behavioral solution. I mean, millennials are driving fewer cars than my generation is driving, so that's, that's hopeful. All right, there was one more question. The, the question is, would, uh, would there ever be consideration for a monorail system down the, uh, the, the Merritt Parkway corridor? Uh, you may be surprised, but there has been consideration of that. Um, Sikorsky, uh, about 20 years ago, designed a con concept for it at DOT's request. And um, I don't think it proved to be feasible because it would be very difficult to put stations along the right-of-way uh, and parking to, you know, th 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 these are all residential neighborhoods. So um, you, could, you could run the monorail down the median, but you couldn't get people to it, so no one would use it. And uh, I think that that was sort of the deal breaker there. But, uh, but that, that has been considered. All right, I know we were told two questions, but if anyone has a question, I'll be around here for a while and happy to. Oh. Thank you.